something beside me A light to the kerosene And the places aren't real anymore And the faces don't say anything Welcome to Devil's Chess Club. I'm Aaron Good. Today, Bryce Green and I are speaking with Dan Kovalik, an American human rights lawyer, labor rights lawyer, and peace activist. He has contributed articles to Counterpunch, The Huffington Post, and Telesaur. For many years, he taught international human rights at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. He has written a number of books, including No More War and Cancel This Book, The Progressive Case Against Cancel Culture. Today, we're talking about his latest book, the case for Palestine, why it matters, and why you should care. You can find a link to purchase this important book in the show notes. To help Dan Kovalik promote the case for Palestine, I've decided to make this episode available to everyone. Devil's Chess Club is part of the American Exception podcast. If you appreciate the political analysis and forensic historiography that we provide here, and if you want to have access to what I have tried to make the best podcast collection of deep political and historical analysis, please subscribe to the American Exception podcast on Patreon. The URL is patreon.com slash American Exception. A link is in the show notes. If you can afford it, please subscribe to the American Exception podcast on Patreon. Dan Kovalik, it's great to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be back. Thank you so much. Yeah, and Bryce, uh, co-host, great to be back with you. Always good to be here, Aaron. So we are here today talking to uh, Dan Kovalik, who is a uh, human rights labor lawyer and a professor of international law at different times uh, in, his, in his long career and a prolific author. And we're going to talk about his newest book. Uh, first, I'll show you a couple of his other books that I recommend you check out. One is No More War. Um, and another one is Cancel This Book, The Progressive Case Against Cancel Culture. But today we are talking about a book that we talked about uh, back in Devil's Chess Club 14, before the book had been published. Uh, and that book is The Case for Palestine, Why It Matters and Why You Should Care. Um, so I guess I could start this off with by asking Dan, why does the case for Palestine matter and why should we care? Yes, well, there's a lot of answers to that. I mean, first and foremost, you know, Palestine, why it matters and why we should care. Obviously, from a humanitarian point of view, um, we need to care. Uh, the genocide that's happening right now in Gaza that's being funded by the United States, armed by the United States, is just... Uh, it outranks any other conflict in terms of very grisly statistics. The number of children maimed, the proportion of women and children killed, the number of UN workers killed, the number of medical workers killed. Um, of course, you have hospitals. Pretty much every hospital in, in Gaza has been uh, either totally or largely destroyed. Uh, mosques and churches have been destroyed. It is a war against the people, you know, and so just from a humanitarian perspective, we should care because also it's our tax dollars that are bankrolling that war. Israel cannot do what it's doing without the U.S. resupplying Israel every like 16 hours is what I read. Uh, but also, of course, Palestine and Israel have been the, uh, you know, hot spot of the world Certainly since 1948 is, you know, many conflicts have emanated from that small little piece of land. Um, and the world, you know, if we go to a world war, it may very well uh, be sparked by what's happening there. Uh, so for that's another reason, of course, 
People should care. It has implications, huge implications for world peace and security, for international law, which has largely been destroyed by um, by Israel, by the U.S.'s running cover for Israel at every international body in the world. Um, yeah, I mean, those are at least a few reasons why why it matters and why you should care. Right, and it really does seem pretty clear that the fate of Palestine kind of hangs in the balance right now. Uh, the, I think the world sympathy for Palestine may be higher than ever uh, at this point. I mean, it likely is. And uh, additionally, the position of the powers that are backing Palestine's tormentors, you know, the strength of, the, of Western imperialism, is actually at the weakest point that it's been in, in, in my in, since uh, really ever. I mean, since, the, since Western imperialism began, since Christopher Columbus first set out as the, I mean, Christopher Columbus is almost like the first white guy in a way, uh, you could think of it in terms of the way he interacted with the rest of the world and just went out and, you know, started killing people and taking all their stuff and setting off this whole process. But of course, the Palestine it traces back even further than that to the Crusades in a way, the, the Western yeah. designs on this part of the world. But so what do you, how do you feel about this particular moment and the, the sympathy for the Palestinians being at an all time high and the strength of Western imperialism at an all time low, and yet the, the, the Palestinians are suffering more than they ever have before. I mean, these things are all related in a, in a strange way. Yes, what you're seeing seems to be the last gasp of not only Zionism and Israel, but really of Western colonialism. And that's what the Israeli project is. It's, it's uh, an extension of Western colonialism with all the evils that go along with that. You know, all the brutality, the murder, the rape, the dispossession, ethnic cleansing, genocide. And we're seeing that again in, in this very extreme way in Gaza at the moment. Um, it's very clear, again, that the U.S. empire is fading from the scene. Israel's fading from the scene because, as you say, not only is there unprecedented, unprecedented sympathy for the Palestinians in the world, there's unprecedented revulsion at Israel and what it's doing. I mean, that's the good news. I mean, because though the evils of Zionism and U.S. empire, I think you, you know, will, will fade, will will collapse at some point. But the problem, the sad truth is uh, the people of Gaza may not live to see that. The, the Gaza is being destroyed. Um, nearly all the infrastructure has been destroyed. They say, I, I read something where it could take 350 years to rebuild what's been destroyed in Gaza. I mean, that's an incredible idea. They said it'll take decades just to get rid of the debris from the buildings that have been destroyed, you know, before you even start building anything. And of course, the human death toll is extreme. You know, the official rate of death is something like 40 plus thousand, and that is that needle's barely moved. We know that that is a gross undercount. The Lancet Medical jour Journal over the summer reported, they, they estimated even then in July, June, July, that at least 186,000 Palestinians have been killed. That was months ago. I think you can, you can bank on the fact that certainly over 200,000 Palestinians have been killed. And I think uh, it is very clear another couple hundred thousand at least will die. Right now in northern Gaza, uh, Israel's laying siege to 400,000 Palestinians, uh, preventing them from getting food, water, um, and, of course, bombing them and um, subjecting them to other violence and in indignities. Um, I think in, in northern Gaza alone, you're going to see a mortality rate of something like 200,000 in fact, there has not been any food or water, or any aid, medicine, anything that's moved into northern Gaza since October 1st. 
and we're nearly at the end of October. So you're talking about a month without food, without water. I mean, this is just uh, catastrophic. So again, on, on the one hand, yes, um, the colonial world as we know it is dying, but in the, they're going to take a lot of people down with it. That That's the sad truth. Right. And it, it seems that, uh, you know, you can situate this whole colonial enterprise uh, in Gaza, especially. Uh, you, you talk about in your book, uh, you cite uh, Harvard economist Sarah Roy and her work going to the Gaza Strip and looking at uh, the economic development, even in the post-Oslo period, when the, you know, the fence was erected. This is before uh, Hamas won elections and Israel put it on the former blockade. But even then, uh, she was talking about the politics of de-development, which is the idea that the Israeli goal was to ensure that Gaza was never going to have an independent economy, that there would always be a a cheap labor force, you know, that, that, that Israeli corporations could exploit, and that this area would be uh, essentially just a, a, a an impoverished enclave. And the, they had no idea what to do with the people. They wanted them to leave, but they couldn't do that because of public relations reasons, and Egypt didn't want to take them in, uh, and they, they weren't going to genocide them just yet. But as this de-development increased, uh, after uh, Hamas's election, the, the blockade, after they stopped allowing uh, any sort of developmental material in, uh, well then, you started seeing these genocidal intents and these, the, this colonial mindset uh, sort of lurch back into the, the 19th century. Uh, with, you know, caste led, you talk about all, all these different attacks uh, through Protective Edge. Uh, I, I forget the, the 2021 name, uh, but all of these happen and you start seeing these, this rhetoric ramp up. And now with the October 7th attacks, uh, you write that Israel now has the justification to, you know, impose these long standing plans on the Palestinians. Uh, so I. I I mean, it's very obvious, but October 7th is a major uh, turning point in both world history and in the history of this process of de-developing Gaza. Uh, and so it, it's important to focus on October 7th and what it was, what it represents in the context of Palestinian history and how it's being used and misrepresented by Western media, by Israeli media to justify this I mean, medieval siege. Yes, well, exactly. October 7th needs to be looked at through the lens of all the terrible things that happened before then. Not only, as you say, the Nakba of 1948, in which 750,000 Palestinians were displaced. And by the way, the people of Gaza, about 70% of the people of Gaza are refugees from the, from the Nakba in 1948. That needs to be kept in mind. I mean, these are people that had already been displaced. And then, as you say, uh, the um, real immiseration of Gaza begins around 2005, as you say, when Israel actually withdraws from Gaza, uh, fences it in, and then begins highly regulating how much food, water, medicine, supplies get in, um, they regulate who can come in, who can leave. Um, and they, you know, openly said that they would give enough, you know, they, they calculated how much calories had to go into Gaza every day just to barely sustain the population. And they ensured that just a little less than that went in. Okay, so as many commentators said, uh, Gaza became a concentration camp. I, I think the quote yeah. from uh, one of the Israeli officials, I think it was the chief of staff, was that the plan was to put Gaza on a diet, but yes. not to let them starve. Yes, and as you said, the other thing they did is they wrecked the economy, made it impossible for them to have any economic independence, and, and, and forced them basically to be dependent on, on humanitarian assistance. So that that humanitarian assistance, assistance could be withdrawn at any time to control the population, right? Um, and so October 7th was a response to this. It was a desperate reaction to people living in these circumstances. Some people, even 
scholars of the Holocaust have compared it to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising during World War II. And that's really what it was. And that's yeah. referred to as an intifada by Palestinians, the Warsaw yes. Ghetto Uprising. No, absolutely. And it was mostly uh, focused on military targets, uh, the goal of Hamas and related militia groups that, that engaged in this. One, they wanted to hit military targets, bases, soldiers, but also they did want to take captives in order to trade for the thousands of Palestinian captives that Israel has had, including many children in their possession. Um, and then, as you say, it was greatly misrepresented what happened. First of all, the figure given for the number of people killed is something like 1,200. Uh, of those, I believe a third, at least a third, are military people. The two-thirds that are civilian it's very clear now that Israel may have killed uh, a majority of those people because the IDF was under the Hannibal Directive, which means they were ordered to kill their own citizens um, if necessary to, to prevent them becoming hostages, and that's what happened. Yeah, this, this has been a this has been a kind of a recurring thing that like there's a number of just bold faced lies that they keep telling that have been debunked. The beheaded babies. Mass rapes. Mass rapes. There's no evidence of that, right? They keep finding the copies of Mein Kampf. <laughs> yes, of course. Yes, even in a kid's bedroom. Again, and that's you know that's a whole nother subject. You know where you know the Palestinians have somehow now the guilt of the Holocaust has now been placed on the Palestinians. It had nothing to do with it, right? Germany that did it. You know, they feel so proud they're supporting Israel, and, and, and you know, which means the oppression of the Palestinians. All the burden of what Germany did to the Jews during World War II, all the burden of that's been placed on the Palestinian people. They've, they've borne all the responsibility, therefore they have to bear the blame, right? And so there's this bizarre way in which the Palestinians are somehow, again, um, transformed into being responsible for what happened in Germany and Europe where, you know, they had nothing to do with that. Um, but as you say, all these lies were told in order to justify what would come later. And that is this genocide in Gaza. The only way they could justify it is to say, oh, they engaged in mass rapes. They, they beheaded 40 babies. Again, none of those things being true. What is true, though, is that there's many thousands of babies that have been now decapitated in Gaza and many women and men being raped by Israel in in um, Israeli prisons and there's On been videotape <laughs> yeah and uh, didn't you know, they basically like, didn't they basically organize a lynch mob to free a, a rapist uh, more or less 10 rapists there were there were 10 or 11 soldiers that gang raped a man so badly he was put in the hospital there was a move i believe by the military police to arrest them and yes there was a a mob gathered uh to free them and those people have become celebrities in israel i mean and you have in the knesset um debates on whether rape of palestinians is justified and okay i mean in in many israelis believe it is because they believe the Palestinians are not human beings and that therefore you can do anything you want to them. And there's no, you know, moral penalty for that. Um, that's how degraded the Israeli society has become. And as many people say, it's not my line, but it's a good line. And it's true that all the accusations Israel makes are in fact confessions. When they talk about beheaded babies, they're the ones beheading babies. When they talk about rapes, they're the ones raping. Um, human shields. Human shields. They're using uh, human, you know, Palestinians as human shields. They use their own people as human shields. And they post you know, them on they TikTok. Talk, yeah, exactly. You know, they talk about, oh, we're going to bomb a, a neighborhood in Beirut because, Hez, you know, Hezbollah has a, you know, house there or something. They're using the people's human shields. Shields. Meanwhile, Mossad, you know, the Israeli analog to the CIA is in a neighbor, you know, populated residential neighborhood in Tel Aviv, you know. Um, so 
but you know these lies work i mean they they have worked uh, you still hear kamala harris talking about october 7th and the mass rapes i mean recently she's it campaigns that's her only response when she's criticized very rightly uh for for the biden harris administration supporting the genocide she always goes back to the lies on uh, of october 7th so yes why they, they have been debunked but largely debunked in the independent uh, media and on social media, um, not so much in the mainstream press, which seems to continue to want to hold on to those lies. It, which is par for the course these days. I mean, everything, the U.S. empire and its PR machine used to be more challenging to debunk. Uh, and it was more, they put, they had a more plausible series of cover stories put out for whatever crimes they were committing, which were pretty consistent and constant because you really cannot rule the world and dominate and exploit everyone lawfully. That to me is so fundamental. It's like I wrote a, you know, that's why I wrote a book on it. It's like you, this system cannot work and be lawful because it, and, or, and or democratic because the people would never vote to be just screwed over in perpetuity the way that they are. But the lies to, around Gaza are of a piece with the lies around like Ukraine, which you've also written about. I mean, this the idea, this the the creation of Israel and the idea of a land without a people or whatever. Yeah, I mean, that's like a foundational yeah, lie. Yeah. But it, you know, in the U.S., we have these lies of the, and things that the media won't talk about, which is like in Ukraine, which is now also a disaster with the Maidan coup, the U.S. hand behind that, which the U.S. press denies. The fact that the West scuttled those peace negotiations uh, really beforehand because Putin didn't want to go into Ukraine, and then in April in Istanbul they did as well, which would have ended the war after a couple months. They allied the Nord Stream bombing. Uh, aspect of it. And then there's, of course, with Gaza, it's all of these other lies as well. Uh, are we reaching a point where these lies uh, are cannot really do what they what they don't function except for in the West, which is essentially a captive and neutralized population? I mean, we are, whatever we think, it doesn't seem to matter anyway, if, because you can't really get a critical mass. But I guess internationally, do you think that the sheer amount of lying that we see, and Gaza is the most brazen example, but Ukraine is not that far behind, really. Do you think that we are re reaching a point where it just, it, it, the, it cannot, the, edif the edifice cannot stand anymore? I mean, we just cannot maintain this level of absurdity in the face of declining power. I do think that, and I think that is why you're seeing more increased repression against protesters, against independent journalists, because the propaganda machine is not successful, because it's not convincing people. And in fact, there's a, I, I saw a recent poll, you know, a very large proportion of the U.S. population no longer has any faith in the mainstream news. Um, and so because they can no longer convince people you know, ideologically, intellectually of, of the rightness of what they're doing, they now have to use repression. So you see Columbia University, for example, you know, which should be a bastion of free speech and, and, and intellectual inquiry, see the president of Columbia University ordering the, in the N NYPD to arrest and beat up her own students on campus and, and it was it came out that in fact there were billionaires that called her and asked her to do that and she did it at their behest and this is happening on a number of campuses campuses that are changing their own codes of conduct to allow for the silencing of pro-palestinian uh, students uh, nyu just did that for example it happened uh, here at iu uh, yeah, they had snipers on the roof and pointed at well, me and targeted me for arrest and yeah. changed, made the rules to make all that okay. And that why are they doing that? They're doing that because they can't they know they can't convince anyone of anything. So they're just going to use brute force. And uh, you have a number of instances of course where people's uh, uh, phones and computers are being taken by the authorities. That happened to me. 
at U.S. Customs uh, about a month ago. Both my phone and, and computer were taken, I assume copied. Um, I know three or four other people that that happened to. Of course, you had Scott Ritter, who the FBI invaded his home in order to do the same thing. Um, you are seeing even worse repression in Europe because they don't have a First Amendment like we do in Great Britain. In Germany, they're just outright arresting pro-Palestinian activists um, and, again, independent journalists. Um, you see Sputnik Radio was just shut down by the Treasury Department in the United States, which had some very good people on it. Uh, very smart people. It, you know, it's some very good shows. Of course, I appeared on a bunch of those shows. I used to. Go I, I hadn't Sean heard about Blackman's, that. Sean, yeah. Sean Blackman show. Yeah, it's gone. Sputnik's yeah. gone. They had uh, stations in ne Washington D.C. and in Kansas City, and the Treasury Department shut them down, essentially by cutting off their financing um, from RT's parent company. In Russia, so all those people, John Kerryak, Rachel Blevins, um, Ted Raw, all those people, they're just out, you know, a Garland Nixon, uh, they're, they're, they're all out of work, at least. I think Chris Hedges had a show there, too. Yeah, uh, that's gone. Overnight, it was gone. And again, all this is because, uh, and, and how many people listen to Sputnik? Let's totally be honest. I mean, how influential was it? Probably not real influential. But they can't even tolerate any noise that goes against the mainstream narrative. Again, for the reason you say, because the mainstream press and the U.S. government are, uh, are failing in their ability uh, to propagandize the U.S. population. And this is sh shown in the polls. Most Americans polled oppose supporting Israel's genociding God. Which, which is amazing, by the way, because everything that they are likely to encounter, 97% of the media coverage they will get is crafted in order to not make them unsympathetic to Israel. And yeah. the fact that that's just testimony, that just testifies to the, the humanity, really, of uh, the American people who are not the psychos that the the this regime uh, is is you know populated by like this is not even though we're we are very brainwashed and there's many pathologies in our culture because of i believe because of really the regime and the system that we live under because we're all human so why do we get to be this way well it's the system that we live under but it's amazing that even still a majority opposes this madness yeah it's even weirder when you look at some of the polls that ask americans basic facts about the about the conflict uh there was a, a poll done a few months ago asking americans whether or not more palestinians have been killed than israelis and uh, more israelis have killed or about the same the majority of americans something like 60 percent uh either put more israelis or about the same uh and even then, I mean, you still have a lot of them opposing the war. So even despite the propaganda matrix that they're all living in, uh, their base human instincts to stop violence, uh, it seems to be coming through. No, absolutely. And I saw another poll that showed very few Americans view Russia as an enemy. Again, even though they've been told that it's an enemy every day for years and years. Um so yeah, the, the, the propaganda is not working. And um, that is a hopeful sign. I mean, obviously that's a hopeful sign. Um, it needs to be, you know, it needs to be translated into more protest. I mean, there are protests over these issues. I think not as big as we need, but um, they're there. Uh, but we need more. We need a growing peace movement. And, and at least the fact that people are not buying the program gives me hope that that sort of movement could be built in this country. So you're, you're pretty well traveled. You talk to a lot of people, uh, a lot of, I don't know if you end up talking to a lot of like Democrat officials or uh, high, high level diehard Democrat supporters. But this interesting thing about the, the lack of trust in the press is that it's largely happening among independents and Republicans. Yes. Uh, but for Democrats, the trust in the press is increasing dramatically uh, to the point where, you know, 70% of them trust the press. And so that's why you had, you know, 
so-called liberals calling for uh, a U.S. intervention in Ukraine to close the sky, so to speak. And, you know, they're, they're the true believers who believe in, uh, you know, the sanctity of American institutions and that the problem is that these institutions aren't strong enough. Uh, do, do you see in your in your milieus that you've been in, uh, do you see that starting to crack in any way with the situation in Gaza? Do you see people who were diehard uh, anti-Russia, Putin is the devil, we got to save Ukraine people. Uh, do you see them taking a second look uh, with this whole Palestine business when the same people who are telling them about Russia are now lying into support of a genocide? Yeah, not, I haven't, you know, I'm not seeing that a lot. I, I, I think the people you're talking about, the diehard uh, Democrat, um, diehard liberals, as you say, they are clinging to the party, to the Democratic Party, to Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, um, and they do not want to see any any wrong that they are doing. Um, and I see that a lot on social media. I mean, most of my friends are liberals, you know, in real life and in social media. And they really bristle a lot when I mention Palestine and talk about, you know, we can't reward Kamala Harris for this at the polls. And they're very offended by that, you know, and I, I think you're right. You know, you mentioned they cling to the, to, to not only the party, but they, to the, to the press, the mainstream press that really is a mouthpiece for the Democrats, the New York times most prominently, uh, but also CNN, MSNBC, uh, the liberals are still very much believing that, that those are telling the truth. And again, you know, a lot of this has to do with what is commonly called Trump derangement syndrome. They hate Trump so much, fear Trump so much that they, um, the, and so they see the Democrats as their only salvation from him. And, and honestly, you know, Trump said, what, in 2016, he could shoot someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue, he'd still get elected. Well, that's true for the Democrats, too. I mean, that is true. They could, you know, they are shooting babies, you know, supporting Israel to shoot babies in Gaza. And yet they have this core group of liberals, which probably rep represents 40 percent of the American people who some yeah. of them think that Kamala has a secret plan and that she's secretly pro-Palestinian. I have actually encountered this, people saying that she's not Joe Biden. And of course, she has to say that she agrees with all the policies, but she's secretly going to do this and that. I mean, what she's level of power level? <laughs> yeah. What level of delusion do you have to have to believe uh, that? Self delusion. Yeah. Um, and by the way, I mean... Even if you believe that, first of all, well, why isn't she doing something now? I mean, literally, the people are dying in Gaza now, and they're literally, uh, you know, they're starving to death. And if this doesn't stop soon, huge portions of Gaza will be dead. Okay, so first of all, she's why isn't she doing it now? Also, is she what's she going to do between November fifth and January twentieth if she is elected? Is she going to wait till then to do so? I mean. There is no waiting. You know, uh, there is no time that the people of Gaza have. So this idea that she would have a secret plan, I guess, in a way, given that reasoning is just absurd because she would have to be doing something now because uh, time is of the essence. And, you know, you've written books that are relevant uh, on other subjects or other countries, other hotspots of U.S. imperialism, really that I think are relevant right now because you've written books about <clears throat> Russia and you've, I believe you've written a book about Iran, right? Yeah. Didn't you write a book about going to war with Iran? So right yeah. now we're on the verge, <clears throat> not only of the presidential election, but of the, uh, a, a, what, uh, what this was some, by some reports is going to be a mutual defense treaty between Russia and Iran being signed. Have you heard anything about this or do you have any insight here or how do you think this might affect what is going the denouement of all this? Because this is quite a, a, a cataclysmic moment where NATO seems to be hanging in the balance and perhaps doomed because of the doomed uh, Ukraine effort. 
And then Iran just repelled an attack, thanks in part to Russian, I believe, Russian military, you know, bolstering their air defenses and such. So we're all waiting to see what the fall is going to be on that. What do you know about the, uh, or what is your opinion on this strengthening alliance between Iran and Russia and how this might be, uh, be brought to bear on the Gaza genocide? Yes, well, I think for the people of Palestine, it's a good thing. I mean, it, I think it, it will add to the resistance against Israel. It may force Russia at some point to directly intervene um, against Israel uh, because that alliance is very strong. And as you say, because Russia is supplying uh, Iran with, with critical arms to repel attacks. Of course, you have Russian troops in Syria, remember, and, and uh, Israel recently has attacked a Russian base in Syria. So on the one hand, this could awaken the bear to get involved, uh, which, you know, I think would be positive for the Palestinians. But of course, it makes what's happening all the more dangerous, because what, what this means is, you know, uh, you could have a World War III that, that comes out of what's happening in the Middle East because, you you know, you do have the U.S. very deeply involved with Israel in this conflict. You have Russia now becoming more deeply involved with Iran uh, in this conflict. So, you know, if they become more directly involved, those two countries, then you have a potential for nuclear war. I mean, that that is where we could be added in all of this. It's a very dangerous moment. Of course, Israel has nuclear weapons too that it has never declared, which is illegal. Um, it's even uh, verboten for U.S. officials to even acknowledge that they have nuclear um, arms. Uh, this this they, makes all yeah. of the U.S. funding of Israel illegal because the, the U.S. is by law not allowed to fund uh, countries who uh, are in violation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, you know, who have nuclear weapons, they're not in violation, but who have nuclear weapons but are not signatories to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Correct. And, and for, so this is just another case where the U.S. is... It takes 30 seconds to explain how the U.S. is doing something illegal, and there's no, there's nothing to be done about it. And the convention among like politicians and media figures is just to studiously pretend that this is not happening. It's just it's remarkable. Yes, no, everyone's pretending that 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 the reality is 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 not there. Well, and the U.S. is you know the arming of is of Israel is illegal in many different ways. Also, because Israel's carrying out a genocide under the Genocide Convention, which the U.S. is a party to, they have an obligation not just to prevent genocide but to stop it. They should not be arming a state that's involved in genocide. Also, it's illegal to uh, provide military assistance to a country. Uh, that is blocking humanitarian aid to people, which uh, we know they are. In fact, the USAID said that Israel is doing that. They said that back in April, as was, did a uh, department in the State Department, uh, the Refugee Bureau, I, I believe. And by the way, both of them made it clear to, to Anthony Blinken that that was happening, that Israel was blocking humanitarian aid to Gaza. And then Blinken turned around and lied to Congress and told them, in fact, Israel was not blocking aid to Gaza in order to allow the arms to keep flowing, because otherwise they could not. And then, of course, you had the Leahy Amendment, another law that prohibits us from giving uh, military support to um, military units involved in serious human rights abuses. Well, that would be um, all the Israeli units involved in the war in Gaza and Lebanon. So... This is illegal many times over. And as you say, where's the debate about that? Where's the debate about that in Congress? Where's the debate about that in the newspapers? Nowhere. Yes, and it was not always this way in the United States. I mean, you had um, Eisenhower say, no, we're not going into, we're not going to back you on this crazy Suez gambit, which is funny because you have some of the same kind of actors that are involved in mischief today, like, um, you know, the, the Brits, how the Brits were 
um, trying to get Biden to authorize bigger military strikes from Ukraine, you know, like, uh, and, and so on. Like, this, uh, this, the, the, the militarist part of the U.S. establishment, which has been intertwined with, I think, Zionists going back to the early days of the post-World War II U.S. empire, but then increasingly with the neoconservatism in the 70s, it's like, you know, that, that emerges after Watergate, you have, I mean, Watergate seems to have propelled Zionist neocons, ultra-Zionist neocons into new positions of power, which I think is like something that needs much further investigation. I've tried to do some work into that. But, I mean, there were presidents like JFK was not in favor of them getting, he worked very hard to try to deny them nuclear weapons. It led to David Ben-Gurion's res resignation. Um, and he also tried to settle the refugee issue in a different, more, he put more energy into that than other presidents. He eventually gave up uh, on certain aspects of it because he, he was told it was impossible to get it through Congress. But, uh, you know, and you can even find video clips of Richard Nixon saying explicitly, listen, there are times when the, the U.S. national interest is not the same as the Israeli national interest, and we have to yeah. pursue the U.S. one. But, and George H.W. Bush attempted to, uh, he, he withheld loan guarantees to force the, the Israelis into uh, negotiations for a two-state solution, and then he loses. I mean, wh what, what explains, in your mind, this transformation of U.S. policy and uh, it's towards something that is accelerating the end of U.S. hegemony? I mean, you, you have a real contradiction that, it, that has, is not easily explained by any conventional political scientist or anyone else, which is, it's pretty clear, although the part of the problem is maybe that you can't have realistic discussions about the U.S. very easily, but let's say this. Uh, it's easy enough to, to demonstrate that the, the guiding mission of the U.S. after World War II is global hegemony over capitalism, okay? And yet, it is pretty clear to me that the Israeli uh, and ultra-Zionist neoconservative um, political formation has backed things that were bad for U.S. hegemony, going back to probably the 67 war, and LBJ was very much, you know, corrupt politician and in the pocket of other, a lot of interests, but, but Zionists as well. And... Um, so you, you have them, that's one shift, like you, the, the shift from JFK to Johnson, huge. Getting rid of Nixon also redounds to the interests of these people. H.W. Bush's defeat in 1992 redounds to their benefit. You get Clinton who signs the, who seems like he's to the left, but he really signs the Iraqi, I mean left, like liberal by the American crazy standard, right? He signs the Iraqi Liberation Act, he pardons Mark Rich. Um, he bombs Iraq while he's being impeached over Lewinsky, which, by the way, looks a lot like kind of a Mossad sort of Epstein sort of operation, right? Now, in retrospect, we can say, like, I wonder what was really going on there in the bedrooms and so on, <laughs> the Oval of the White House. But, I mean, what, what do you think, exp and when Bush comes in, Bush comes in, and my understanding from people close to the Bush family, it, even, that have communicated with them, is that W. Bush believed his father lost because he stood up to the Israel lobby. And so he brings in Cheney and basically says, just like, let me get reelected by doing whatever they want. And then he does, and he's, he gets reelected. But this starts a 21st century where the U.S. has just embarked on stupid misadventure in the Middle East that's, that it's not very difficult to look at all of these as being undertaken more for the benefit of Israel than for the U.S. because there's no logic to, to it for it to be done on behalf of the U.S., in my estimation. How do yeah. you explain these things? Because a lot of people are asking wh these days why, and everybody has their own, you know, point of view. But what do you think is the reason for the U.S. doing this? Because, you know, even as we're talking about how the U.S. is seen as, as worse than it ever has been before, that they don't benefit from this. So why, why do you think we've arrived at this point with the U.S. acting in such a stupid fashion? Well, first of all, our leaders are dumber than they've ever been. I mean, I mean, let's be totally blunt. I mean, you know, that, that we are choosing between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. I mean, this would be unimaginable uh, before. These are not bright people, uh, educated people. You know, we had John F. Kennedy would quote you know, Greek poets, for goodness sake. Um, 
So first of all, you have a leadership that's declined. Our diplomatic uh, school skills have declined. Um, why has all that happened? I think, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, explanation for that. But I think, that, you know, the fact that money, especially after Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court, which allowed unlimited money into the electoral system, the fact that money now buys elections, basically, and the fact that APAC gives a lot of that money, I think that has something to do with it. Um I think the best and the brightest people aren't even seeking office because, again, it costs so much money to run for an office. I think, you know, well-intentioned, decent, smart people don't even want to try. Of course, you put your reputation at risk by doing it. Another reason people don't do it, I think, in a way that you didn't before. Um, you know, the media used to be kind of soft, you know, on, on, on people's politicians' personal lives. That's not true anymore. Um, so those are all reasons. Again, I think I think APAC has really put a stranglehold on our, our political system. You have nearly no one in Congress who isn't dominated by APAC. I mean, th there's only a few Congress people who can say that. Um, and so I think a lot of it is fear of, of politicians, as you say, that if they don't play ball, with APAC and Israel, that they will be defeated. And and they don't have the moral cojones to stand up to that. Um, I don't know if that's a good explanation. But I also think one other big world thing that happened that changed the U.S. in many ways was the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. I think that collapse had huge impacts on the West. I think the West no longer felt any moral pressure from the Soviet Union. They did feel a lot of moral pressure from the Soviet Union because we were competing with them. And we know, for example, just one example, we know that the civil rights legislation in the 60s was signed, yes, in response to U.S. protests, but also because we were embarrassed in the face of the East Bloc, that, that these things, terrible things were happening to black people in the United States. So we know, we know that, that we know that that influenced legislators in the White House. Well, you don't have that pressure anymore. You don't have that moral pressure coming from the Soviet Union. Um, I think that cannot be underestimated. A lot of people don't think about that, but I think a lot was lost in the West when the Soviet Union collapsed. The U.S., you know, then sought total dominance of the world, saw its opportunity to dominate as the sole power, and again, didn't feel it needed to make concessions to anyone on anything, um, including on supporting Israel or supporting Israeli atrocities. So that is one big picture item. I also think, finally, that, that, that the, the change in our economic system has led to the worst happening. You know, when we no. were making stuff, making steel, making autos, making, you know, and um, I think that there, that grounded, you know, even as bad as capitalism was, it grounded uh, our ruling class in some kind of reality and, and, and tethered them somewhat to us as people. Now that we live in a fine, you know, an economy that is largely financialized, meaning you can just make money by having money and investing money, even betting on the outcome of this election, right? People are betting millions of dollars. We live in a giant casino now. I mean, you could even bet on, I mean, when you understand what these derivatives and, and such are all about, you can basically bet on any aspect of the economy and you can even bet on other people's bets. I mean, it is it, it, it's it's completely absurd. Yeah, uh, it's unbelievable. Um, this has a moral corrupting aspect, right? This corrupts our politicians. This corrupts our society. It cor corrupts our rulers. And, um, yeah, I mean, th those are all reasons we see this real decline in our society, in our political system in the leaders that we even have a choice to vote for. Um, it's the decline of the empire. That's what we're seeing for all the reasons we're saying. 
Um, and no, I, yeah, I think that the also the decline of the end of the Soviet Union was likely a neoconservative production as well, in, in my opinion. <clears throat> and I'll say this because you look back at the things that were happening in the Soviet Union, people talk about how the analysts in the CIA were surprised by the Soviet Union's collapse. But uh, I think that you also have the operations arm of the CIA and you have the sort of international aspects of the of capitalism and the, the clandestine part of it. But look at what was happening in the years leading up to that. You had countries in the Eastern Bloc indebted, apparently on purpose, like basically caught in debt traps um, in, in, the year, in the years leading up to the collapse of the Soviet Union. You had the U.S. going into a war in Afghanistan or really luring the Soviets into a war in Afghanistan. Uh, in order to damage their economy, and they, the U.S. at that point, the heroin trade centers there, which is a huge boon to U.S. finance and this new financialized system because it's sucking all that drug money into it. But it's also flooding Russia, the Soviet Union, with heroin. They're launching. They, people don't know about this, but Bill Casey even launched uh, different, you know, destabilizing paramilitary operations in Tajikistan and so on back during the in the later years of the Cold War, you know, in the in the Reagan administration. Um, and they additionally use things like the Helsinki Accords to manipulate civil society more. So the U.S. backed Solidarity and other, you know, liberal darlings like you know Vaclav Havel and people around him, like all over the place. Uh, and they even af affected a collapse of the price of oil, like Gorbachev was planning to use oil revenues to reform the Soviet economy in different ways that would have made it more, that would have brought it more into a more market-oriented kind of a system. It wasn't going to be a capitalist, but it was going to be market-oriented. But he couldn't because the, the, the U.S. collapsed the price of oil right at that time. Like, I think that the Soviet Union was taken down by, a, it was sort of a hybrid warfare yes. to end the Soviet Union. Of course. And, the re, and they wanted, multi, the neocons would have been the people behind this, and they wanted the unipolar moment. They didn't just wake up and find themselves like, oh, right. let's go for full-spectrum dominance. These people are lunatics. And you look back at what they're arguing, you know, even you trace them back to Wolstetter, and other people who do tie into the, uh, and people like Scoop Jackson do connect to other people that we think of as being in the Israel lobby, like Richard Pearl and so on. I mean, there's this American militarism that becomes intertwined with Zionism and what becomes neoconservatism. And they took down the Soviet Union, I think on purpose. And then they're talking about, hey, we're the unipolar power. We rule the world. This is great. Let's go for full spectrum dominance. And you've got the Wolfowitz Doctrine, which says, Anybody who might become powerful enough, we should to challenge our hegemony. We should just destroy them. I mean, this has uh, been a long-standing pipe dream of theirs, and it tracks pretty evenly also with the Greater Israel Project and a lot of the same personnel. I mean, how do how do we conceptualize the the uh, importance of expansionist greater Israel Zionism in shaping the foreign policy of the U.S.? Because you look at these people, and they are kind of lunatics, but they're very single-minded, and you can actually look at the, the way that they've influenced U.S. policy to bring us to this point. But this point is a disaster for even from the perspective of U.S. hegemony. Well, yes, but that's how all empires die. They they die, you know, by their own overexpansion and their own overreach. That's what destroys all... Um, all people that that seek dominance in the end that that this the searching for that dominance destroys yourself it's a very human thing and we've seen it time and time again and so i think the the, the empire is is experiencing that slow collapse now again because of its its hubris and uh again its will to dominate that is not a healthy will and um, of course, the the uh, push for greater Israel is, is is really just part and parcel of that will to power that the U.S. has, because you know Israel is now fully a U.S. project. You know, it began a British project; it's now the U.S. project. And of course, the U.S. took over for many colonial po powers like Britain after World War II. Um, but again, every every empire that's existed has, you know, de been destroyed by their own greed and hubris and uh, and, and 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 will to 
to, to dominate in, in the U.S. will be no exception. Um, and, and we're seeing that process now. We're seeing all the suffering that that entails as well. Dan Kovalik, where is the best place for people to get your book? Well, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it uh, from my publisher, skyhorsepublishing.com online. Um, you can go to your local bookstore. If they don't have it, ask them to order it. Very good. I recommend that people get this book. It's an excellent reference. Uh, if you want to understand uh, the, the backstory of the Gaza genocide that we see unfolding today uh, and be better armed to debate and discuss this with people, the case for Palestine, why it matters and why you should care. Uh, Dan Kovalik, thank you very much for joining us again. Thank you. I really appreciate it, guys. Really. Always. Thank, thank you. you very much. As I said in the intro, I have made this episode available to everyone to help promote Dan Kovalik's important new book, The Case for Palestine, Why It Matters and Why You Should Care. Check the show notes for links to purchase the book. And please do subscribe to the American Exception podcast on Patreon. There you will find the best coverage and analysis of the deep politics of the U.S. Empire. The URL is patreon.com slash American Exception. It's also in the show notes. If you can afford it, please subscribe. Thanks to Dana Chavaria for producing this episode, and thank you for tuning in. It was wonderful to have Dan Kovalik back talking about Palestine. Setting aside all the brutal history and sinister, deep political intrigues of Western imperialism, neoconservatism, and Zionism, we look at photos like this one and many that are far worse, and we are confronted with an inescapable moral imperative. We must confront the evil which mindlessly slaughters children and other civilians. Even if we cannot stop such evil, we must bear witness. It is spiritual death to passively and silently allow innocent children to be sacrificed like pawns on the devil's chessboard.